Chapter Four of Fifty Years in Chains or the Life of an American Slave by Charles Ball. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Salma Yasser. It was now about the middle of June, the weather excessively warm, and from eleven o'clock a.m. until late in the afternoon, the sand about our residence was so hot that we couldn't stand on it with our bare feet in one posture more than one or two minutes. The whole country, so far as I could see, appeared to be a dead plain, without the least variety of either hell or dale. The pine was so far the predominating timber of the forest, that at a little distance the entire woods appeared to be composed of this tree. I had become weary of being confined to the immediate vicinity of our lodgings, and determined to venture out into the fields of the plantation, and see the manner of cultivating cotton. Accordingly, after I had made my morning meal upon corn cakes, I sallied out in the direction which I had seen the slaves of the plantation take at the time they left the house at daylight, and following a path through a small field of corn, which was so tall as to prevent me from seeing beyond it, I soon arrived at the field in which the people were at work with hoes amongst the cotton, which was about two feet and a half high and had formed such long branches that they could no longer plow in it without breaking it. Expecting to pass the remainder of my life in this kind of labor, I felt anxious to know the evils, if any, attending it, and more especially the manner in which the slaves were treated on the cotton estates. The people now before me were all diligently and laboriously weeding and hauling the cotton with hoes, and when I approached them, they scarcely took time to speak to me, but continued their labor as if I hadn't been present. As there didn't appear to be any overseer with them, I thought I would go amongst them and enter into conversation with them. But upon addressing myself to one of the men, and telling him, if it wasn't disagreeable to him, I should be glad to be acquainted with him, he said he should be glad to be acquainted with me. But Master Tom didn't allow him to talk much to people when he was at work. I asked him where his Master Tom was, but before he had time to reply, someone called, Mind your work there, you rascals! Looking in the direction of the sound, I saw Master Tom sitting under the shade of a sassafras tree at the distance of about a hundred yards from us. Deeming it unsafe to continue in the field without the permission of his lord, I approached the sassafras tree, with my hat in my hand, and in a very humble manner, asked leave to help the people work a while, as I was tired of staying about the house and doing nothing. He said he didn't care. I might go and work with them a while, but I must take care not to talk too much and keep his hands from their work. Now, having authority on my side, I returned, and taking a hoe from the hands of a small girl, told her to pull up weeds, and I would take her row for her. When we arrived at the end of the rows which we were then hilling, Master Tom, who still held his post under the sassafras tree, called his people to come to breakfast. Although I had already broken my fast, I went with the rest for the purpose of seeing what their breakfast was composed of. At the tree I saw a keg which contained about five gallons, with water in it, and a gourd lying by it. Near this was a basket made of splits, large enough to hold more than a pick. It contained the breakfast of the people, covered by some green leaves of the magnolia, or great bay tree of the south. When the leaves were removed, I found that the supply of provisions consisted of one cake of cornmeal, weighing about half a pound for each person. This bread had no sort of seasoning, not even salt, and constituted the only breakfast of these poor people, who had been toiling from early dawn until about eight o'clock. There was no cake for me, and Master Tom didn't say anything to me on the state of my stomach.
but the young girl whose hoe i had taken in the field offered me a part of her cake which i refused after the breakfast was dispatched we again returned to our work but the master ordered the girl whose hoe i had to go and get another hoe which lay at some distance in the field and take her row again i continued in the field until dinner which took place about one o'clock and was the same in all respects as the breakfast had been master tom was the younger of the two brothers who returned from the cockfight on the evening of our arrival at this place he left the field about ten o'clock and was succeeded by his elder brother as overseer for the remainder of the day after this change of superintendents my companions became more loquacious and in the course of an hour or two i had become familiar with the condition of my fellow laborers who told me that the elder of their young masters was much less tyrannical than his younger brother and that whilst the former remained in the field they would be at liberty to talk as much as they pleased provided they didn't neglect their work one of the men who appeared to be about forty years of age and who was the foreman of the field told me that he had been born in south carolina and had always lived there though he had only belonged to his present master about ten years i asked him if his master allowed him no meat nor any kind of provisions except bread to which he replied that they never had any meat except at christmas when each hand on the place received about three pounds of pork that from september when the sweet potatoes were at the maturity of their growth they had an allowance of potatoes as long as the crop held out which was generally until about march but that for the rest of the year they had nothing but a peck of corn a week with such weeds and other vegetables as they could gather from the fields for greens that their master didn't allow them any salt and that the only means they had of procuring this luxury was by working on sundays for the neighboring planters who paid them in money at the rate of fifty cents per day with which they purchased salt and some other articles of convenience this man told me that his master furnished him with two shirts of tow linen and two pairs of trousers one of woolen and the other of linen cloth one woolen jacket and one blanket every year that he received the woolen clothes at christmas and the linen at easter and the other clothes if he had any he was obliged to provide for himself by working on sunday he said that for several years past he had not been able to provide any clothes for himself as he had a wife with several children on an adjoining plantation his master gave only one suit of clothes in the year to the mother and none of any kind to the children which had compelled him to lay out all his savings in providing clothes for his family and such little necessities as were called for by his wife from time to time he had not had a shoe in his foot for several years but in winter made a kind of moccasin for himself of the bark of a tree which he said was abundant in the swamps and could be so manufactured as to make good ropes and tolerable moccasins sufficient at least to defend the feet from the frost though not to keep them dry the old man whom i have alluded to before was in the field with the others though he was not able to keep up with his row he had no clothes on him except the remains of an old shirt which hung in tatters from his neck and arms the two young girls had nothing on them but petticoats made of coarse toed clothes and the woman who was the mother of the children wore the remains of a tow linen shift the front part of which was entirely gone and a piece of old cotton bagging tied around her loins served the purposes of an apron the younger of the two boys was entirely naked the man who was foreman of the field was a person of good sense for the condition of life in which fortune had placed him and spoke to me freely of his hard lot i observed that under his shirt which was very ragged he wore a piece of fine linen cloth apparently part of an old shirt wrapped closely around his back and confined in front by strings tied down his breast i asked him why he wore that piece of gentleman's linen under his shirt and shall give his reply in his own words as well as i can recollect them at a distance of near thirty years 
I have always been a hard working man, and have suffered a great deal from hunger in my time. It is not possible for a man to work hard every day for several months and get nothing but a pick of corn a week to eat and not feel hungry. When a man is hungry, you know, if you have ever been hungry, you must eat whatever he can get. I haven't tasted meat since last Christmas, and we have had to work uncommonly hard this summer. Master has a flock of sheep that run in the woods, and they come every night to sleep in the lane near the house. Two weeks ago, last Saturday, when we quit work at night, I was very hungry, and as we went to the house we passed along the lane where the sheep lay. There were nearly fifty of them, and some were very fat. The temptation was more than I could bear. I caught one of them, cut its head off with the hoe that I carried on my shoulder, and threw it under the fence. About midnight, when all was still about the house, I went out with a knife, took the sheep into the woods, and dressed it by the light of the moon. The carcass I took home, and after cutting it up, placed it in the great kettle over a good fire, intending to boil it and divide it when cooked between my fellow slaves, whom I knew to be as hungry as I was, and myself. Unfortunately for me, Master Tom, who had been out amongst his friends that day, hadn't returned at bedtime, and about one o'clock in the morning, at the time when I had a blazing fire under the kettle, I heard the sound of the feet of a horse coming along the lane. The kitchen walls were open, so that the light of my fire couldn't be concealed and in a moment I heard the horse blowing at the front of the house. Conscious of my danger, I stripped my shirt from my back and pushed it into the boiling kettle, so as wholly to conceal the flesh of the sheep. I had scarcely completed this act of precaution, when Master Tom burst into the kitchen, and with a terrible oath, asked me what I was doing so late at night with a great fire in the kitchen. I replied, I'm going to wash my shirt, master, and I'm boiling it to get it clean. Washing your shirt at this time of night, said he, I will let you know that you're not to sit up all night and be lazy and good for nothing all day. There shall be no boiling of shirts here on Sunday morning, and thrusting his skin into the kettle, he raised my shirt out and threw it on the kitchen floor. He didn't at first observe the mutton, which was to the surface of the water as soon as the shirt was removed. But after giving the shirt a kick towards the door, he again turned his face to the fire, and seeing a leg standing several inches out of the pot, he demanded of me what I had in there, and where I had got this meat. Finding that I was detected, and that the whole matter must be discovered, I said, Master, I'm hungry and I'm cooking my supper. What is it you have in here? A sheep, said I, and as the words were uttered, he knocked me down with his cane, and after beating me severely, ordered me to cross my hands until he bound me fast with the rope that hung in the kitchen, and answered the double purpose of a clothes line and a cord to tie us with when we were to be whipped. He put out the fire under the kettle, drew me into the yard, tied me fast to the mill-post, and leaving me there for the night, went and called one of the negro boys to put his horse in the stable, and went to his bed. The cord was bound so tightly round my wrists that before morning the blood had burst out under my fingernails, but I suppose my master slept soundly for all that. I was afraid to call anyone to come and release me from my torment, lest a still more terrible punishment might overtake me. I was permitted to remain in this situation until long after sunrise the next morning, which being Sunday, was quiet and still, my fellow slaves being permitted to take the rest after the severe toll of the past week, and my old master and two young ones having no occasion to rise to call the hands to the field didn't think of interrupting their morning slumbers to release me from my painful confinement. However, when the sun was risen about an hour, I heard the noise of persons moving in the great house, and soon after a loud and boisterous conversation, which I well knew portended no good to me. 
at length they all three came into the yard where i lay lashed to the post and approaching me my old master asked me if i had any accomplices in stealing the sheep i told them none that it was entirely my own act and that none of my fellow slaves had any hand in it this was the truth but if any of my companions had been concerned with me i shouldn't have betrayed them for such an act of treachery could not have alleviated the dreadful punishment which i knew awaited me and would only have involved them in the same misery they called me a thief loaded me with authors and imprecations and each one proposed the punishment which he deemed the most appropriate to the enormity of the crime that i had committed master tom was of opinion that i should be lashed to the post at the foot of a chalet and that each of my fellow slaves should be compelled to give me a dozen latches in turn with a roasted and greased hickory gat until i had received in the hall two hundred and fifty lashes on my bare back and that he would stand by with the whip in his hand and compel them not to spare me but after a short debate this was given up as it would probably render me unable to work in the field again for several weeks my master ned was in favour of giving me a dozen lashes every morning for a month with the whip but my old master said this would be attended with too much trouble and besides it would keep me from my work at least half an hour every morning and proposed in his turn that i should not be wept at all but that the carcass of the sheep should be taken from the kettle in its half-boiled condition and hung up in the kitchen loft without salt and that i should be compelled to subsist on this putrid mutton without any other food until it should be consumed this suggestion met the approbation of my young masters and would have been adopted had not mistress at this moment come into the yard and hearing the intended punishment loudly objected to it because the mutton would in a day or two create such an offensive stench that she and my young mistresses would not be able to remain in the house my mistress swore dreadfully and cursed me for an ungrateful sheep thief who after all her kindness in giving me soup and warm bread when i was sick last winter was always stealing everything i could get hold of she then said to my master that such villainy ought not to be passed over in a slight manner and that as crimes such as this concern the whole country my punishment ought to be public for the purpose of example and advised him to have me whipped that same afternoon at five o'clock first giving notice to the neighbourhood to come and see the spectacle and to bring with them their slaves that they might be witnesses to the consequences of stealing sheep they then returned to the house to breakfast but as the pain in my hands and arms produced by the ligatures of the cord with which i was bound was greater than i could bear i now felt exceedingly sick and lost all knowledge of my situation they told me i fainted and when i recovered my faculties i found myself lying in the shade of the house with my hands free and all the white persons in my master's family standing around me as soon as i was able to stand the rope was tied round my neck and the other end again fastened to the mill-post my mistress said i had only pretended to faint and master tom said i would have something worth fainting for before night he was faithful to his promise but for the present i was suffered to sit on the grass in the shade of the house as soon as breakfast was over my two young masters had their horses saddled and set out to give notice to their friends of what had happened and to invite them to come and see me punished for the crime i had committed my mistress gave me no breakfast and when i begged one of the black boys whom i saw looking at me through the pails to bring me some water and a gourd to drink she ordered him to bring it from a puddle in the lane my mistress has always been very cruel to all her black people i remained in this situation until about eleven o'clock when one of my young mistresses came to me and gave me a piece of johnny cake about the size of my hand perhaps larger than my hand telling me at the same time that my fellow-slaves had been permitted to re-boil the mutton 
that I had left in the kitten, and make their breakfast of it, but that her mother would not allow her to give me any part of it. It was well for them that I had parboiled it with my shirt, and so defiled it that it was unfit for the table of my master. Otherwise, no portion of it would have fallen to the black people. As it was, they had as much meat as they could consume in two days, for which I had to suffer. About twelve o'clock, one of my young masters returned, and soon afterwards the other came home. I heard them tell my old master that they had been round to give notice of my offence to the neighbouring planters, and that several of them would attempt to see me flogged and would bring with them some of their slaves who might be able to report to their companions what had been done to me for stealing it was late in the afternoon before any of the gentlemen came but before five o'clock there were more than twenty white people and at least fifty black ones present the latter of whom had been compelled by their masters to come and see me punished amongst others an overseer from a neighbouring estate attended and to him was awarded the office of executioner i was stripped of my shirt and the waistband of my trousers was drawn closely round me below my hips so as to expose the whole of my back in its entire length it seems that it had been determined to beat me with thongs of raw cowhide for the overseer had two of these in his hands each about four feet long but one of the gentlemen present said this might bruise my back so badly that i could not work for some time perhaps not for a week or two and as i could not be spared from the field without disadvantage to my master's crop he suggested a different plan by which in his opinion the greatest degree of pain could be inflicted on me with the least danger of rendering me unable to work as he was a large planter and had more than fifty slaves all were disposed to be guided by his counsels and my master said he would submit the matter entirely to him as a man of judgment and experience in such cases he then desired my master to have a dozen pods of red pepper boiled in a half gallon of water and desired the overseer to lay aside his tongs of rawhide and put a new cracker of silk to the lash of his negro whip while these preparations were being made, each of my thumbs were lashed closely to the end of a stick about three feet long, and a chair being placed beside the mill post, I was compelled to raise my hands and place the stick to which my thumbs were bound over the top of the post, which is about eighteen inches square. The chair was then taken from under me, and I was left hanging by the thumbs with my face towards the post and my feet about a foot from the ground my two great toes were then tied together and drawn down the post as far as my joints could be stretched the cord was passed round the post two or three times and securely fastened in this posture i had no power of motion except in my neck and could only move that at the expense of beating my face against the side of the post the pepper tea was now brought and poured into a basin to cool and the overseer was desired to give me a dozen lashes just above the waistband and not to cover a space of more than four inches on my back from the waistband upwards he obeyed the injunction faithfully but slowly and each crack of the whip was followed by a sensation as painful as if a red-hot iron had been drawn across my back when the twelve strokes had been given, the operation was suspended, and the black man, one of the slaves present, was compelled to wash the gashes in my skin with the scalding pepper tea, which was yet so hot that he could not hold his hands in it. This doubly burning liquid was thrown into my row and bleeding wounds, and produced a tormenting smart beyond the description of language after a delay of ten minutes by the watch i received another dozen latches on the part of my back which was immediately above the bleeding and burning gashes of the former whipping and again the biting stinging pepper tea was applied to my lacerated and trembling muscles this operation was continued at regular intervals until i had received ninety-six lashes and my back was cut and scalded from end to end 
every stroke of the whip had drawn blood many of the gashes were three inches long my back burned as if it had been covered by a coat of hot embers mixed with living coals and i felt my flesh quiver like that of animals that have been slaughtered by the butcher and are flayed while yet half alive my face was bruised and my nose bled profusely for in the madness of my agony i hadn't been able to refrain from beating my head violently against the post vainly did i beg and implore for mercy i was kept bound to the post with my whole weight hanging upon my thumbs an hour and a half but it appeared to me that i had entered upon eternity and that my sufferings would never end at length however my feet were unbound and afterwards my hands but when released from the cords i was so far exhausted as not to be able to stand and my thumbs were stiff and motionless i was carried into the kitchen and laid on a blanket where my mistress came to see me and after looking at my lacerated back and telling me that my wounds were only skin deep said i had come off well after what i had done and that i ought to be thankful that it was not worth with me she then bade me not to groan so loud nor make so much noise and left me to myself i lay in this condition until it was quite dark by which time the burning of my back had much abated and was succeeded by an aching soreness which rendered me unable to turn over or bend my spine in the slightest manner my mistress again visited me and brought with her about half a pound of fat bacon which she made one of the black women roast before the fire on a fork until the oil ran freely from it and then rubbed it warm over my back this was repeated until i was greased from the neck to the hips effectually an old blanket was then thrown over me and i was left to pass the night alone such was the terror striking into my fellow slaves by the example made of me that although they loved and pitied me not one of them dared to approach me during this night my strength was gone and i at length fell asleep from which i didn't awake until the horn was blown the next morning to call the people to the corn crib to receive the weekly allowance of a peck of corn i didn't rise nor attempt to join the other people and shortly afterwards my master entered the kitchen and in a soft and gentle tone of voice asked me if i was dead i answered him that i was not dead and making some effort found i was able to get upon my feet my master had become frightened when he missed me at the corn crib and being suddenly seized with an apprehension that i was dead his heart had become softened not with compassion for my sufferings but with the fear of losing his best field hand but when he saw me stand before him erect and upright the recollection of the lost sheep revived in his mind and with it all his feelings of revenge against the author of its death so you're not dead yet you thieving rascal said he and cursing me with many better authors ordered me to go along to the crib and get my corn and go to the work with the rest of the hands i was forced to obey and taking my basket of corn from the door of the crib placed it in the kitchen loft and went to the field with the other people weak and exhausted as i was i was compelled to do the work of an able hand but was not permitted to taste the mutton which was all given to the others who were carefully guarded while they were eating lest they should give me some of it this man's back was not yet well many of the gashes made by the lash were yet sore and those that were healed had left long white strips across his body he had no notion of leaving the service of his tyrannical master and his spirit was so broken and subdued that he was ready to suffer and bear all his hardships not indeed without complaining but without attempting to resist his oppressors or to escape from their power i saw him often while i remained at this place and ventured to tell him once that if i had a master who would abuse me as he had abused him i would run away where could i run or in what place could i conceal myself said he i have known many slaves who ran away but they were always caught and treated worse afterwards than they had been before i have heard that there is a place called philadelphia 
where the black people are all free but i do not know which way it lies nor what road i should take to go there and if i knew the way how could i hope to get there would not the petrel be sure to catch me i pitied this unfortunate creature and was at the same time fearful that in a short time i should be equally the object of pity myself how well my fears were justified the sequel of my narrative will show End of chapter four recorded by Salma Yasser.